if you want to be effective to the Joe Witness, you need to know their Bible translation with such familiarity that you know what verses to avoid in discussion. And because I'm familiar, I know what verses not to turn to. And also, the Joe Witness translation suffers from what I call the lo lower case G syndrome. Lower case G syndrome. What do I mean? You will find, quite often, verses that you quote to prove Jesus is God. In their Bible, they translate it as a God, lower case G. So I call this the lower case G syndrome. Like in John 1.1, 1, 1, their translation says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was a God. So I know not to turn to John 1, because John 1 would then entail a lengthy exposition of the Greek. Now, how many of you have time to break down the Greek for a Jehovah's Witness? Let's be honest. Right? Thank you. So avoid those controversial passages and go to the passages where they translate it correctly, at least for this version. Now, what do I mean? In John 10.33 ESV, how does it read? John 10.33 ESV, how does it read? Read out loud. The Jews answered him, it is not for a good work that we, that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself... God. Now, do you want to see this disease called lowercase g? This is lowercase g syndrome? Look at their translation. The Jews answered him, we are stoning you not for a fine work, but for blasphemy. For you, although being a man, make yourself a God. Do you see it? A God, lowercase g. This is what I call the lowercase g syndrome. It's a disease, right? Oh, yeah, let me give you John 1.18, because ESV would read only God. John 1.18, can you go to John 1.18 in the New World Translation? John 1.18 in the ESV translates the, the Greek words monogenes, theos, in a very amazing manner. So Jesus is said to be the only God. Powerful! Now, some would debate the translation of monogenes, but that's irrelevant. Let's put that aside. In your translation, ESV, it will say, if you want to read it, read it from ESV. No one has ever seen God the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Powerful, isn't it? Jesus is the only capital G God. Powerful witness to his deity. Not if a Jehovah's Witness reads it from his translation. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten, lowercase g, God. Now, what do you think will happen when you quote John 1.18 and they turn to their Bible? They're going to say, yeah, yeah, see? He's an only begotten God, a lowercase g God created by Jehovah. So what are you trying to prove to me? No, no, it doesn't say that. My Bible says, well, your Bible is corrupt. This is the only perfect translation because it's produced by the anointed class. So learn what passages not to quote so you don't get into a debate on Greek grammar, syntax. Do you really have time to go into the Greek grammar and you think they're going to trust you? So why didn't Jesus just come out and say, I'm God? That would have miscommunicated. Just like if you say to a Jehovah's Witness, hey, Jesus is Jehovah. You know what you told the Jehovah's Witness? Hey, Jesus is the Father. And they're scratching their head. How can he be the Father? What are you talking about, man? Who's he praying to? Who sent him? Right? Why would he say the Father is greater than I? How can it's Because they don't define language the way you do. So one rule is know how to communicate your belief effectively to the person that you're sharing the gospel with. If he's a Muslim, think like a Muslim. Share the gospel in a way that a Muslim can understand it. Jehovah's Witness, think like a... Put yourself in their shoes if you really want to see them get saved and be an effective tool in the hands of the Holy Spirit. I should have told you what they believe about Jesus Christ. Let me put that in perspective, because this is all preparatory. The Jehovah's Witness believe, and some of you already know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but when I actually found out the specific details of their belief, it blew me away. I thought I knew what they believed. He's the Archangel Michael. It gets a little more complicated. If you ask a Jehovah's Witness, who's the first creature that God made? They'll say the Archangel Michael. Well, who's the Archangel Michael? He's the human Jesus. But here's where it gets baffling. In Jehovah's Witness theology, the Archangel Michael ceased to exist when the human Jesus was conceived in the womb of his mother. So God took the life force of the Archangel Michael and his memories and implanted it in that human seed. But Archangel Michael ceased to exist when the human Jesus came into being. So he wasn't an angel in the flesh. He was just a man with the memories of Michael and the life force of Michael, whatever that means. Does that sound like your Jesus?
So their God is not your God, their Jesus is not your Jesus, and their spirit is not the spirit you believe in. But this is what they believe. So this is what they believe. Now, how do we show them they're wrong? The do's and don'ts of witnessing to Joe's witnesses. Number one, try as much as you can to use their Bible against them and know what passages to cite and what passages not to cite. Let me give you an example. Some of the most powerful passages showing that Jesus is God deliberately mistranslated in the New World Translation. Let's go to Acts 20, 28 in the ESV. Look, now this will work for those who are not raised as Joe's witnesses believing their Bible is the best translation. Quoting Acts 20, 28, powerful witness to the two natures of Christ. Acts 20, 28 is one of the most powerful witnesses to the fact that Jesus is God and human, two natures, one person, not if you are witnessing to a Joe's witness. And Acts 20, 28, read it for us in the ESV. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. God has blood? God has blood? Yes. This heretic is saying no. You ready to become a Jehovah Witness? What's wrong with you, man? Yeah, God has blood. You're scaring me, bro. I think we brought you here to expose you, man. A secret Assyrian Jehovah Witness. Talk about an oxymoron right there, right? Anyway. Right? Yes, God has blood. It said it. God purchased the church by his blood. This clearly is a reference to Jesus as God and human. He is God who became human and shed his human blood to purchase the church. Clear, right? Everyone see it clear? Not in the Jehovah Witness Bible. You can see it over there. Here's the Joe Witness Bible. Pay attention to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit. And by the way, did you notice the Holy Spirit, the H and the S is lowercase? Because they don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person, so they put it lowercase deliberately. Right there. Which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers to shepherd the congregation of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. Guess what, folks? Even the Greek that they use, the word son is not there. They added it. So in their translation, it isn't God that shed his blood to purchase the church. God purchased the church with the blood of his own son. But wait, Mr. Witness, when I go to your interlinear, let's go to their Greek. The word son is not in the Greek. Why would you insert it? We know why, right? Why do you think they would insert a word that's not in the Greek? To rob Jesus of the glory of his deity. Okay, right here. Be you paying attention to selves and to all the flock, right? <clears throat> In which you, the Spirit, the Holy, put overseers to be shepherding the ecclesia. I don't know why they didn't translate that. And notice, they never use the word church in their translation, by the way. They never use the word church because they believe churches are part of a corrupt satanic system. So they translated congregation. That's why even their churches, they're not called churches, they're called kingdom halls. They don't like to use the word church. Because of its association with corrupt Christendom. So notice, ecclesia of the God, which he reserved for self through the blood of the one. Where's the word son? Where's the word son? It's not even in their Greek. Let me give you a couple more examples, and then I'll give you one example where then you can use their Bible to prove that Jesus is Jehovah God. And then let's go to, what translation should I use here? Titus 2.13. Yep, Titus 2.13. In the ESV, Titus 2.13, how does it read? Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow! Jesus is our great God and Savior. And for a Jew, the only great God is Jehovah. So Paul just identified Jesus as Jehovah. Not in the Jehovah Witness Bible. Look how it reads. While we wait for the happy hope and glorious manifestation of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. They make it seem as it's referring to two persons. The great God and Jesus Christ, our Savior. So now, do you have time to unpack the Granville Sharp rule to show them that this is a mistranslation? And do you think they want to hear your arguments? So avoid these. Now let me give you an example, one example of other citus, what I call other citus, and then show you some verses 
that you can use to prove the Trinity deity of Christ. Now again, this would entail a series of lessons to walk you through the use of the Jehovah's Witness Bible. I don't have that. So I'm hoping to whet your appetite that you begin the journey. If you really feel God has called you to witness to the witnesses, you got to know their sources. Now, let's go to Philippians 2, verse 9. Other Sidus. Philippians 2, verse 9, in the ESV, how does it read? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Does your translation say every name? Jesus has been given the name that's higher than every name? Yeah. Not according to the Jehovah Witness. For this very reason, God exalted him in a superior position and kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. So Jesus doesn't possess the highest name imaginable, which would be the name Jehovah. He possesses a name that's higher than every other name because there's still one name higher than his, the name Jehovah, because he's not Jehovah. Do you see the word other? Or am I making it up? You see the word other? Right? Guess what? It's not in their Greek. Boy, do I love their interlinear. It destroys the satanic organization. Go to Colossians 1. Colossians 1. One of the most powerful passages proving Jesus is the eternal creator of all creation. Not if you read a Jehovah's Witness Bible. Colossians 1, 16, 17 ESV. Look how powerful a witness this is to Christ being eternal, uncreated, almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. Pay attention to the language. And it's talking about Christ. If you start at 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all or of all creation. Then it says in 16, why is he the firstborn? Read 16. For by him all things were created. Some things. In heaven. Wait, before you go on. Some things. All things. Most things. All things. Well, hold on, brother. No, I'm, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I am smarter than David Wood. That's another point. Here's what I want to ask you. If it says Jesus created all things, meaning all creation, that means Jesus existed before all creation, right? But if he existed before all creation, then he's not a creature, is he? Because the only thing you have before creation is eternity. So you're telling me that here Paul's saying Jesus is eternal because he created all things, which means he's older than all creation, which means he's not part of creation. That's what Paul is saying? Absolutely. Now finish it. All things were made by him, created by him. In heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So wait, all things? All things. But what about verse 17, though, man? You missed out 17, you, you secret Jehovah Witness, you. Verse 17. And he is before all things. Now, right there, if I tell you Jesus is before all creation, because all things is all creation, can you get any clearer that Jesus is uncreated? If I say Jehovah is before all things, no Jehovah Witness would be confused as to the point. They would understand I'm saying he's before all creation because he's uncreated. But Paul said that about Jesus. He is before all things. And in Jesus, in him, all things consist. He sustains everything. You don't get more clear than what Paul wrote that Jesus is the almighty creator and sustainer of all creation. Not if you read a Jehovah Witness Bible. Notice their translation. Because by means of him, all other things were created. They inserted the word other four times in this translation. All other things were created in the heavens and on the earth, the things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. He is before all other things, and by means of him all other things were made to exist. Four times they inserted the word other in a t text that clearly shouts, Jesus is no creature, he's uncreated, he's God Almighty. Four times they inserted the word other. But thank God for their Greek. Let me show you their Greek. Now let's go to the Greek interlinear. Colossians 1.16. Notice the Greek. Can you show me where the word other is in their Greek? This is their Greek. Because in him it was created the all things. Tapanta. There's no other. They're Greek. Tapanta. All things. In the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible, the things invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, the all things. Do you see the word other in their Greek? It's tapanta, all things. 
All things through him and into him it has been created. And he is before all things, pro panton. And the all things in him has stood together. How dare you add the word other four times when even your own Greek interlinear exposes your corruption and fraud. So clearly you can use their own sources to show the deliberate shameful butchering of the Bible. Okay, how do I then now use the Bible, their Bible, their perversion to my advantage? I'll just give you one example for the sake of time. And believe me when I tell you, I can be here for days giving you example after example. No exaggeration. I'm not lying. Let's go to Isaiah 44 verse 6. This is what Jehovah says, the king of Israel. Notice how they translate certain words, repurchaser. Repurchaser, he repurchased you, right? I mean, weird way of translating the word redeem, but that's okay. The king of Israel, his repurchaser, Job of armies, I am the first and I am the last. There's no God but me. I am the first and I am the last, okay? Pay attention to what Job is saying. I am the first, I am the last. Isaiah 48, verse 12. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I have called. I am the same one. I am the first, I am also the last. So who's the first and the last? Jehovah, right? What does it mean when it says Jehovah is the first? See, it's not enough just to quote a verse. You got to understand the implication of these titles. What does Jehovah mean when he says, I am the first and the last? What does he mean? You don't need to guess. He explains it in Isaiah 41 verse 4. Who has acted and done this? Summoning the generations from the beginning. I created the generations from the beginning. I, Jehovah, am the first one, and with the last ones, I am the same. He explained it. I've been with the first generation, and I'll be with the very last generation. Did you catch what he just said? With the very first generation, I'm there. I've been with the first one, and I'll be with the last ones. So what does it mean for Jehovah to be the first last? It means he's been there from the start, at the very beginning of creation, with the first generation of humans, and he's going to continue to be with every subsequent generation of humans till the end of the age. It is simply another way of saying that Christ is timeless, or I should say Jehovah, and Jesus is Jehovah, that God is timeless. He's not bound to time, space, and place. Because he's timeless, he was there from the beginning, will remain with us to the end of the age, because unlike us, he's not bound to time. In other words, it's simply another way of saying Jesus is eternal. I keep saying Jesus because, you know, I'm a Trinitarian. Jehovah's eternal. We know it's Jesus, but you want to get them to see that. So you get them to see, hey, who's the first last? Jehovah. Chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran. For those of you who witnessed the Muslims. Chapter 57, verse 3, it says, he, Allah, is the first and the last. It says Allah is the first. So at least the Quran got something right. The title first and last is the title of deity, even though the Allah of the Quran is a false god. So you, you can use this for the Muslims. Say, hey, Muslim, who's the first and the last? Allah. Allah Akbar. Right? Jehovah Witness, who's the first and the last? Jehovah. Then I go to Revelation 117. I don't read 18. And I love the reaction when I see it. <laughs> In me power. No, the, Revelation 117. Here's what I do. I go, okay, so you agree it's Jehovah, right? Jehovah Witness? You agree, Muslima? Allah? All right. Revelation 117, watch this. When I saw him, I fell as dead at his feet, and he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. So I pause. Who's the first and last? Automatically, they'll say Jehovah. If it's a Muslim, they'll say Allah. And then I say, when did Jehovah die? What do you mean? Verse 18. And the living one and became dead. And look, I am living forever and ever. When did Jehovah die? Jehovah didn't die, Jesus did. But you just said that's Jehovah speaking. Thank you for admitting Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh. And Muslim, stop saying Allahu Akbar, say Al Masihu Akbar, the Messiah is greater. Because you just admit Jesus claimed to be God. That's one of the many ways you can use their Bible to your advantage. I wish I had more time. I can show you a lot more that's even clearer than this and how to respond to their objections to your arguments. But at the end of the day, remember. Remember how to witness to Joe's witnesses, how not to witness Joe's wit to, uh, Jehovah's witnesses. Be familiar with their Bible to avoid these pitfalls of quoting the wrong passages. With that said, can you want me to open up for a couple minutes of Q&A? So, no? What a hater you are, bro. Okay, we're done. All right, God bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed.